Welcome, I'm Dr. Rick Wadge, and you're watching episode eight of The World Then and Now with our special guest, Dr. Dina Dye. Hi, Rick. Good to be back for uh, you, yeah next episode. I think we should probably go right into the clip, okay. uh, that, that first clip that we have. Okay. Take a look at this. We'll be right back. Now, Hitler, we know, used the Jews as a scapegoat, blamed them for everything, and it wasn't hard to do in that environment. And that included the, the economic hardship they had been through. It was easy to blame the Jewish population. They're kind of like the 1% we blame today, quote, the rich who caused all our problems. Obviously, it went much further than that. But it's that same thing when a dictator rises to power and figures out what segment of the population he can blame everything for, and everyone dutifully follows along. Um, it says that at, at the time, nearly 120 billion Reichmarks, or what would be uh, about 12 billion pounds, British sterling today, was plundered from the German Jews by the laws that they implemented by their policies and, and of course, what they looted as well. The taxing authorities under the Nazis worked actively to destroy the Jews financially and totally and to loot all the, the rest of the wealth of the nation. See, that's what socialists do. They claim that everything is equal. Let us, let's all be equal in how, in how much we have. But the, the real goal here is for them to take all the wealth and give it to their buddies. That's really what it's about. Even Jews who managed to escape from Germany before the Holocaust had to leave most of their wealth behind. And they had to pay what was called an exit tax. I'm sure at that time they were all too happy to pay that to get out of Germany and to move somewhere safe. The tax laws totally discriminated against Jews from 1934 on. And we can see that too in our society that tax laws punish certain segments. The tax laws are often designed to punish behavior and prevent certain ones from succeeding in the environment. Um, we also, there was obviously a boycotting of Jewish businesses at that time, and I don't really see any difference between the advocating of these leftist progressive radicals of boycotting businesses in Israel, particularly in the Judea Samaria area with their boycott, divestment, sanction movement, which we see alive and well and, and on, especially on college campuses. If you dared oppose the Nazis or Hitler politically, especially with words, you had better watch out. And so we can compare the Gestapo with today's modern leftists, how they would love to put us all in jail for what we say. And uh, for example, if you don't believe in man-made climate change, they would like nothing better than to lock you up. And we see this in various social uh, issues of our day, homosexuality, use, the use of gender pronouns, uh, illegal immigration, abortion, infanticide, just take your pick. If you, When you speak out, uh, you are going to get pushback. There is no question about it because they do not want you to say or think what you, what, what you determine is right based on your faith in God and the culture that we live in. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Tax law to control behavior. I, I was so blown away. And, and at this recording, um, so the Jews had to pay an exit tax on their wealth. Well, recently, a lawmaker in California is pushing to uh, uh, basically charge a tax on all of the people who are leaving California. And why would they leave California? Gee, I don't know. Why would they leave? <laughs> they did the same thing in Illinois, you know, when people sold their homes. Um, and I think to a certain degree in uh, New York. So, I mean, they're doing exactly the same thing that the Nazis did to the Jews. The California legislature wants to do to the, anyone who's trying to get out of California and, be, you know, get free 
Is that just staggering? It really is. It's hard to believe that we allow uh, our past history to go unnoticed so that we're not learning from it. I mean, imagine if you actually had legislators serving in office who knew history. <laughs> imagine. I mean, you. I, I'm trying to remember, I think it was back when this all began, somebody did an interview with the governor from, I believe it was New Jersey. Patrick, is it Patrick Duvall, I think, is the governor. I could be wrong. But anyways, in he basically made the statement that the, the Constitution and the First Amendment was above his pay grade. <laughs> it's like, okay. I mean, you know, to have people, we have people serving in office who know nothing of the Constitution and, uh, you know, no foundation, no foundational understanding of our history. So this is dangerous. But the people have voted them in. The people have voted them in. So what that means is, is that our educational system is not teaching our citizens their own rights and what makes this the greatest country in the world. Exactly. Well, I mean, and that's how, you know, that re reading 1984, I mean, that's you just remove their history and you manipulate it and, and you know, you tear down their statues and you, you know, uh, we what we're creating now, our new history is the 1619 project instead of, you know, um, 1776. So we've got these two vying histories. But that rewriting of history, uh, this came out of the New York uh, New York Times. This is exactly the same thing that happened with the in the Orwell's book, 1984, a complete revisionist history. So yeah, I guess if you remove it, um, you're condemned to repeat it. You know, I've been frustrated as a uh, as a post pastor. Uh, <laughs> I hope I, you got therapy. <laughs> I, I still work with you in therapy, uh, but when I go to a congregation to assess it, whether or not it's a good fit for, for myself and my wife. Uh, I'm, I'm very uh, disillusioned by the blather that tends to come out of many pulpits. The lack of, in, of research, the lack mm -hmm. of understanding the context of Scripture itself, the real message that would have meant for them then, and then how to convey that to the people today. But we're seeing exactly the same thing with our politicians, and not just that. We see the same thing taking place in the news agencies today. Mm -hmm. That there's no logic going on in many of those. And we're being influenced heavily. The people are being influenced on how they should vote come November by what they're watching on television by people that haven't done the research. They have a bias themselves. And so we're becoming disciples of the newscasters instead of truth. Yeah, I mean, the news media today, I think it might be worse than Pravda was in the Soviet Union, but there's there's no daylight between the Democrat Party and, and the media, like none. I mean, I'm not sure who has more influence, but, it, you know, I don't know if it's the media pulling the Democrats along or the other way around, but regardless, they're, they're you know, they're married. That's a marriage made in heaven to them. And so that level of control over information. I mean, we live in a time, we are drowning in information. It's very hard to sort through. And especially in this uh, so-called emergency of the virus, it has become even more obvious how much we're drowning in information. So for example, I, you know, there's certain ones I follow, they're reputable, credible, but everybody now has a podcast. So, you know, if I listened every day to my favorites and their podcast, my day is over. And it's one of the reasons I decided not to even do a podcast. It's like, how much more information can people take? And this is by design. We just drown people by design in information so they cannot sort through it. So this is another area you're going to have to exercise some caution and some wisdom. And don't feel, you know, at the very least, take a day off of media completely. No social media, no media, no nada. Take a break, you know, go outside, walk, you know, hang out with your family or do whatever. Um, but this is dangerous because you cannot tell, it's hard to tell truth from fiction when there's so much coming at you. And I think there's a, I agree with that 100%. I think also there's another side to this and that is when we're drowning in this negative, yeah. negative, negative all the time, it's hard for us to still have hope. 
I, I think the the other thing with this virus is that in, in their lust for power and authoritarian control, the Democrats have made everything miserable. Like we are a miserable people. Everything, I mean, there's no sports, you know, edu there's no school there, you know, the government forcing itself on you with all the varieties of restrictions. There's no family gatherings. There's no church. Um, there's nothing. And it's just this misery. And then you wear a mask so you can't smile and engage, you know, we're in a very dangerous place. We really are. And so it's up to us who know better, who have a relationship with God and the joy that, that comes with that to express that joy out there. We got to take that out because people are not, I mean, they're not on the receiving end of it. If we're in the same, you know, if we're reacting the same way, where's the joy and the hope and the glory of, our, you know, of our heavenly father in our lives? I'm uh, tempted to push us into the next clip. Okay, yeah. As I'm looking through the notes, it's just uh, there's a lot of lot of content here we can talk. Okay, yeah, about let's do it. All right, hopefully you're ready for this as well. We're going to go into the second clip in episode eight and uh, take a look at this. So now we also have the thought police, uh, particularly on college campuses that you're no longer to f free to think for yourself anymore. They have driven critical thinking skills into the ground. There's no place for reason and debate and uh, logic. All the things that the underpinnings of society is when you have a people that actually can think for themselves and that you can function and make decisions according to your own conscience. The, the left has basically become anti-family. It is anti-Judeo-Christian in its values. It's antithetical to everything that we hold dear. Um, this has also moved into the business world, which is particularly frightening. So coercing people in the business environment, employees or whatever, to force them to accept this cultural revolution we're experiencing and redefining the goals of that cultural revolution. So what's good for business uh, is also, this is the nature of the tyranny. That's what's good for business. It's a place, according to them, in which employees can exercise virtue, which, of course, nothing could be further from the truth. These business environments have become totalitarian. Uh, and it, that thinking has covered nearly every aspect of life in the company. So, you know, think Google, Amazon, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Uh, their goal, rule the world and control their employees. Their, their goal is to shape the cultural politics within the company and to shape the, the employee's behavior. Um, basically, they want to discipline their employees into what they consider to be the true religion. And part of that discipline within these tech companies, for example, is urging them to police those within their ranks. Uh, sounds a lot like Hitler and the Nazis. It will even, a company will even instruct its employees um, on how to conduct a s personal struggle sessions, if you will, to root out within themselves what they consider to be false beliefs. And these false beliefs are what the company would say undermines diversity and inclusion within the company. Uh, they pretend that the company is actually diverse. And there are myriads of examples of this when employees have come forward and declared this company is anything but diverse. They are totally shut down. Within the company, many empl employees simply do not have the luxury of thinking differently than the company line. Or, I mean, I don't see any difference between how these companies function and how Nazism functioned in World War II. Business thought police. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Yeah. I, so in the same way that the media has married itself to the Democrat Party, I would say that the big business has done exactly the same thing, that the, the corporations have totally bowed and caved to the BLM Antifa move. And not because of the ideology, but only because of profit. 
they don't want these guys coming and boycotting them. So they're going to do whatever they have to do to prevent that from happening. And virtually every large corporation has caved in that way. It's just shocking to see. You can see it in the commercials. You can see it in the scripting. You can see it in, I, I think, everything. One of the things I said, I don't know if I said it in the Bonhoeffer uh, series. I think I might have, which was a year and a half ago. I said, you know what? It's going to get to the point where I can't shop anywhere. I'm not even going to be able to eat because I'm not be able to go in any store or buy anything because I don't agree with their philosophy, their ideology. <laughs> so well, you know, here you know, I am. Even if we had not come upon this Wuhan virus uh, originating from China, whatever the motivation is, we could debate about sure. this off camera because there's a lot to talk about. And I'm pretty opinionated when it comes to that. But even with that having been said, I am very much about buy American first. Yeah. Okay. So when you look at all the items that we have in our stores, in our big box stores, most of those items come from China. And so my opinion is, when are we going to grow up? When are we going to realize we are cutting our own throats economically and be able to provide middle class with jobs? Well, this has been going on really since the 90s, over 30 years. Thank you, Bill Clinton. Thank you, free traders. Thank you, Wall Street. Thank you, Republican rhinos. Thank you, Democrats. They totally sold out the middle class and all the jobs went over to China and they make everything. So the virus made it very obvious because now all our medicines are made there, ibuprofen and vitamin C and our antibiotics all made in China. So there we were without PPEs and you know all our medical supplies, etc. Now early on, um, I, I've already forgotten her name, I, hopefully I think of a uh, uh, Rosemary, it'll come to me, wrote a book, um, Rx, something about Rx. She, back in 2002, recognized, uh, Gibson's her name, she recognized that uh, this is what was going on, that our all our product, all our medical medicines were being made in China. And she went to everybody. I mean, Congress over and over again, and nobody cared, nobody paid a whit. Because what you have to understand is our congressmen and women, Republican and Democrat, are making giant profits off of the Chinese uh, and the big pharmaceutical companies, massive. We're talking massive amounts of money. So nothing got done, but she, you know, she sounded the alarm. And so her and uh, several others actually uh, have been, have the ear of the president. And back in March, I want to say another, his trade guy, Peter Navarro, they were working together, America First, uh, deal, you know, with the, with the medicines, et cetera. And finally, I believe it was about two weeks ago, the president did sign the executive order on that, that our medicines would start, would come back to the United States and start being made here. And the other thing people should know, uh, right now, China's experiencing these massive floods, uh, the Three Gorges Dam that they built on the Yangtze, which was a disaster to begin with, but now it's barely holding the water. You've got Chongqing and Wuhan on either side of the dam. The water's coming through rivers off of the Himalayas. And the Chinese, uh, they're having to release water at night and tell people it's from the rain. But these two cities are ready to go under. Now, if that dam breaks, all of the manufacturing plants are downstream from Wuhan, and that will wipe out the entire uh, medical industry. Uh, there, there'll be no more plants left. So we got, I mean, and they're in jeopardy of food shortages as well. So we got that going on. So there is this, uh, there is an America First. There's a guy named Kurt, uh, Curtis Ellis who's also supporting this. So there is an America First push under this president, which has not happened really in the inception of, of our country. Well, at least probably since Eisenhower. We haven't, you know, we haven't seen that. So that's another reason to vote for the president because he's trying to bring these manufacturing jobs back home. Um. <laughs> well, you just look at Pittsburgh as an example. Yeah. You know, we were the leading, one of the leading sources of structural steel and metals. And um, it completely, I think, completely collapsed. And then we were bringing in, barging in, all of our uh, steel from other companies, uh, other countries like yeah. Japan, yeah. China, Indonesia, 
And it just killed the industry in uh, Pittsburgh. And then you think of the car manufacturers. And so all these things, you're exactly right. Yes. Yeah. Well, you have the free traders to thank, Wall Street to thank for all of this, the globalists to thank. I mean, I their goal was to crush the middle class. I don't think I'm going to thank them. Okay, well, I, I, I wouldn't either. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so this is, this is this corporate greed that we talk about. It's not, you know... People, people will say, well, you know, capitalism, greedy capitalists. But honestly, the, the greediest of them all are the socialists. Socialists are way more greedy than capitalists. In the capitalist system, you got the winners and the losers and the marketplace kind of dictates. But in socialism, these, the, the rulers take all the money and give it to their buddies, you know, and you don't get any of it. And the divide between rich and poor is, becomes starker and starker. I mean, it's the middle class of America that's the engine. Really, it's the, the business engine, commercial engine of the whole world. And they're just, you know, their goal. So you saw in this pandemic, the, the restrictions were always on the, the small business. So the, the Walmarts and the Targets, they were all allowed to thrive. It was especially obvious in our state. Our governor has literally killed every small business, 154,000 small businesses in New Mexico, and she has just crushed the lifeblood out of it in favor of the big box, large corporations. They win. I know you're not an economist, but I'm you not. are very wise when it comes to watching trends, watching the news, uh, finding people of um, logic to yeah. be able to listen to. And so when we were talking in an earlier episode about one third of the restaurants in New York shutting down permanently, and that was their projection, what do you think is going to happen to the middle class after the dust clears, after the pandemic and the riots, if it clears? Well, I don't see, you know, the only way the middle class thrives, one of the biggest uh, hurdles for any business is all the ridiculous regulations. That's what crushes business. Uh, so if you have a red state governor who will re pull off these regulations and allow small businesses to go ahead, you know, they don't need massive amounts of permits and they don't want to follow all these stupid rules and things that just add money, you know, to, to whatever it is they're trying to produce. They'll, they'll thrive in that environment. But in a state like ours, I don't see I don't see small business even coming back. the The only way out of it for us is I mean we need a we need a, a free market governor, we need a new governor, and we need a new legislature. And I don't know I mean I don't know if it's going to happen. We'll see this fall if we actually have a you know if our we have a Republican uh, roundhouse, uh, which is the shape of our government government building. But there, um, so. Biz, small business, it's going to be so difficult for them. Who on earth is going to start an, a business in this environment? So that forces everybody to go work for someone else. And the reason they do that is because small business owners are independent thinkers. And they actually understand how the economy works, as opposed to most Democrat lawmakers don't even know how the economy works. Uh, you know, they go to Harvard Business School and then they get indoctrinated by Marxism by these professors. So again, small business is the key to everything. But if you crush it, uh, you know, I don't know how that comes back. There's another issue on the stage right now that I've been hearing discussions about, and that is the construction of high rises for homes, for people being able to live in homes. And th what the discussion is, is will there be a future after this COVID-19 or during it, because they don't know if it's going to go away, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> during COVID-19, do you continue to build um, apartments in the air with a thousand people living in this building with the same central air conditioning piping through all the vents? Or is that going to go away? And so it has ramifications for large cities with small amounts of land to be able to build more homes. I guess what I'm saying is, is there are a lot of changes. Oh, absolutely. We're talking groundbreaking, paradigm-shifting demographics. So 70% of people in the cities um, and really around the country are saying 
they want to get out of the cities into the suburbs and into more rural areas. I find this very ironic because if you read, are familiar with the Agenda 2021 uh, or Agenda 2030 of the UN, the goal was to get everybody into the cities so they could control them. And so the very opposite thing is happening from what they wanted. Everybody, no one in their right mind who, you know, who's able to get out of the city wants to stay there. They want to get out and more and more into rural areas. So now, you know, the, the cities are basically Democrat strongholds. They continue to vote for this, that philosophy. So if all those people are leaving the cities and moving out into the rural areas, like what happens to the politics in all those places? But the whole idea of controlling everybody in the city seems to, you know, who is going, there's no reason to go live in New York City anymore. If you can go work remotely at home, what on earth do you need all that commercial real estate in there? And apartments and, I mean, Everything's empty, so there is a massive shift coming. Yes, so think about how that's going to impact uh, the economy. Yeah, I mean, everything's up for grabs. And maybe we we return back to our agricultural roots, you know, as people are going back to, you know, purchasing smaller farms and ranches out in in more rural areas to grow food because they got to grow food because our food supply chains are being upended. I mean, I guess there's no more uh, aluminum cans are a problem now in stores. We heard that from the Smith's grocery store. Uh, you know, everything is in flux. Thank you for the good news. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I'm only happy because I live on five acres out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Just, but, yeah. uh, you know, we, we need to prepare and, and we really need to do it now. And, you know, I don't like to make hurried, rush decisions. And so I'm just encouraging you wherever you are, you know, to make those decisions soon. Pray as a family and figure out. But you're going to have to be flexible. You're going to have to, to be fast on your feet and make decisions. It's not like, you know, you got five years and you can wait to go do something. Yes. You know. So our job, in my opinion, as believers and followers, of the God of the Bible is to make sure that we're leading society in a positive, righteous, ethical way. And so that means that what's coming up in November, what's taking place right now in the city you're in, the county you're in, wherever you're at, is so vitally important. We cannot go to sleep right now. If the prophets were here right now, I believe they would be saying something very similar, and that is wake up. You know, because your redemption draws nigh, Amen. as they would say. And I believe that that's true. We don't know when uh, Messiah is going to come and reign. We don't know. Uh, but we pray daily that he would come today. Until that takes place, it's your job and my job, Dina's job, to influence this society in a positive way so that we buy back what the enemy has taken. He's here to kill, steal, destroy. And I think you can see that every day of what's going on around our nation. Let's buy it back. Let's take it back by doing the right thing. And remember, vote in November. We'll see you next time. Come on!